Mother Savage. I had not been back to Virlon for 15 years. I returned there to do some shooting in the autumn, staying with my friend Serval, who had finally rebuilt his chateau, which had been destroyed by the Prussians. I was terribly fond of that part of the country. There are some delightful places in this world which have a sensual charm for the eyes. One loves them with a physical love. We people who are attracted by the countryside cherish fond memories of certain springs, certain woods, certain ponds, certain hills, which have become familiar sights and can touch our hearts like happy events. Sometimes indeed the memory goes back towards a forest glade or a spot on a river bank or an orchard in, a, in blossom, glimpsed only once on a happy day but preserved in our heart like those pictures of women seen in the street on a spring morning wearing gay, flimsy dresses which, have, which leave in our soul and flesh an unappeased, unforgettable desire, the feeling that happiness has passed us by. At very long, I loved the whole region, scattered with little woods and crossed by streams which ran through the ground like veins carrying blood to the earth. We fished in them for crayfish, trout, and eels. What a heavenly happiness we knew there. There were certain places where we could bathe, and we often found snipe in the tall grass, which grew on the banks of those narrow brooks. I walked along, as light-footed as a goat, watching my two dogs foraging ahead of me. Serval, a hundred yards to my right, was beating a field of lucerne. I went round the bushes which marked the edge of the soja wood, and I noticed the cottage in ruins. All of a sudden, I remembered it as it had been the last time I had seen it, in 1869, neat, covered with vines, with chickens outside the door. What is sadder than a dead house, with nothing left standing but its skeleton, a sinister ruin? I remember that, too, that a woman had given me a glass of wine inside the house one day when I was very tired, and that afterwards Serval had told me the story of the occupants. The father, an old poacher, had been killed by the gendarme. The son, who I had seen before, was a tall, wiry fellow who was likewise supposed to be a ferocious killer of game. People called the family the Savages. Was it a name or a nickname? I called out to Serval. He came over to me with his long, lanky stride, and I asked him, What has become of the people who lived here? And he told me this story. When war was declared, the younger Savage, who was then 33 years old, enlisted, leaving his mother alone at home. People didn't feel too sorry for the old woman, though, because they knew she had money. So she stayed all alone in this isolated house far away from the village on the edge of the woods. But she wasn't afraid because she, made <clears throat> she was made of the same stuff as her men. A tough, tall, thin old woman who didn't laugh very often and whom nobody joked with. Country women don't laugh much anyway. That's the men's business. They have sad, narrow souls because they lead dull, dreary lives. The peasant learns a little noisy gaiety in the tavern, but his wife remains serious, forever wearing a stern expression. The muscles of her face have never learned the motions of laughter. Mother Savage continued to lead her usual life in her cottage, which was soon covered with snow. She came to the village once a week to get bread and a little meat, and then she returned to her cottage. As there, was a to as there was talk of wolves in the region, she went out with a gun slung over her shoulder, her son's gun, which was rusty with the butt worn down by the rubbing of the hand. She was a strange sight, the savage woman, tall, rather bent, striding slowly through the snow, with the barrel of the gun showing above the tight black headdress, which imprisoned the white hair nobody had ever seen. One day the Prussians arrived. They were distributed among the local inhabitants according to the means and resources of each. The old woman, who was known to be well off, had four soldiers billeted on her. There were four big young fellows with fair skin, fair beards, and blue eyes who had remained quite plump in spite of the hardships they had already endured and good-natured even though they were in conquered territory. Alone with that old woman, they showed her every consideration, sparing her fatigue and expense as best they could. All four were, were to be seen washing at the well every morning in their shirt sleeves, splashing water in the cold glare of the snow over their pink and white flesh, the men of the north, while Mother Savage went to and fro cooking their soup. 
They could then be seen cleaning the kitchen, polishing the floor, chopping wood, peeling potatoes, washing the linen, and doing all the household jobs, just like four good sons helping their mother. But the old woman kept thinking all the time about her own son, her tall, thin boy with his hooked nose, his brown eyes, and the bushy mustache which covered his upper lip with a roll of black hair. Every day she asked each of the soldiers sitting around her hearth, Do you know where the French regiment has gone, the 23rd Infantry? My boy is in it. They would reply, No, we don't know. We have no idea. And understanding her grief and anxiety, they who had mothers of their own at home, performed countless little services for her. She, for her part, was quite fond of her four enemies, for peasants scarcely ever feel patriotic hatred. That is the prerogative of the upper classes. The humble, those who pay the most because they are poor, and because every new burden weighs heavily on them, those who are killed in droves, who form the real cannon fodder because they are the most numerous, and who in word suffer the most from the atrocious hardships of war because they are weakest and most vulnerable, find it hard to understand those bellicose impulses, those touchy points of honor, and those so-called political maneuvers which exhaust two nations within six months, the victor as well as the vanquished. The people around here, speaking of Mother Savage's Germans, used to say, those four have found a cozy billet, and no mistake. Now, one morning when the old woman was alone in the house, she caught sight of a man a long way off in the plain coming towards her. Soon she recognized him. It was the man whose job it was to deliver the letters. He demanded her, he handed her a folded piece of paper, and she took the spectacles she used for sewing out of their case. And then she read, Madame Savage, this is to give you some sad news. Your son Victor was killed yesterday by a cannonball which pretty well cut him in two. It was very close seeing as we were side by side in the company and he had asked me to let, me, let you know if anything happened to him. I took, his, I took his watch out of his pocket to bring it back to you when the war is over. Best regards, Césaire Riveau, private in the 23rd Infantry. The letter was dated three weeks earlier. She didn't cry. She stood stock still and, so and shocked and dazed that she didn't even feel any grief yet. She thought to herself, now it's Victor who's gone and got killed. Then little by little the tears came into her eyes and grief flooded into her heart. Ideas occurred to her one by one, horrible agonizing ideas, that she would never kiss him again, her big boy, never. The gendarmes had killed the father and the Prussians had killed the son and he had been cut in two by a cannonball, and it seemed to her that she could see the horrible thing happening, the head falling, the eyes wide open while he was chewing the end of his bushy mustache, as he always did when he was angry. What had they done with his body afterwards, if only they had sent her boy back to her, as they had sent back her husband, with the bullet in the middle of his forehead? But then she, said, she heard the sound of voices. It was the Prussians coming back from the village. She quickly hid the letter in her pocket, Having had time to wipe her eyes, greeted them calmly, looking her usual self. All four of them were laughing with delight, for they had brought back a fine rabbit, which had probably been stolen, and they made signs to the old woman that they were going to eat something good. She set to work straight away, getting dinner ready, but when it came to killing the rabbit, her heart failed her. And it wasn't the first by any means. One of the soldiers had to kill it with a punch behind the ears. Once the animal was dead, she stripped the skin from the red body, the, but the side of blood was, she was touching, which covered her hands, the warm blood which she could feel growing cold and congealing made her tremble from head to foot, and she kept seeing her big boy cut in two and red all over like the animal still quivering in her hands. She sat down to table with her Prussians, but she couldn't eat, not so much as a mouthful. They devoured the rabbit without bothering about her. And she watched them on the sly, without speaking, thinking over an idea, her face so expressionless that they noticed nothing. And suddenly she said, We've been together a whole month now, and I don't even know your names. They understood, not without some difficulty, that she wanted and gave, <laughs> and gave her their names. But that wasn't enough. She got them to write down for her a piece of paper, on a piece of paper with the addresses of their families, and setting her spectacles on her big nose, she inspected the unfamiliar script, 
and then folded the sheet of paper and put it in her pocket with the letter which had told her of the death of her own son. When the meal was over, she said to the men, I'm going to do some work for you, and she started taking up straw up to the loft where they slept. They were puzzled by what she was doing. She explained to them that the straw would keep them warmer, and they gave her a helping hand. They piled bundles and bundles of straw up to the roof, and thus made themselves a sort of big, warm, sweet-smelling room with four walls of forage, where they would sleep wonderfully well. At supper, one of them was upset to see that Mother Savage didn't eat anything, and she said that she was suffering from cramps. Then she lit a good fire to warm herself, and the four Germans climbed up to their room by the ladder, which they used every evening. As soon as the trap door was closed, the old woman took away the ladder. Then she quietly opened the outside door and went out to fetch some more bundles of straw which, with which she filled the kitchen. She walked barefoot in the snow, moving so quietly that the men heard nothing. Every now and then, she listened to the loud, uneven snores of the four sleeping soldiers. When she decided her preparations were sufficient, she threw one of the bundles of straw into the hearth, and when it had caught fire, she scattered it over the others, and then she went outside and watched. Within a few seconds, a blinding glare lit up the whole inside of the cottage. Then it became a fear fearful brazier, a gigantic furnace, the light of which had shone through the narrow window and fell on the snow in a dazzling ray. Then a great cry from the top of the house, followed by a clamor of human screams, of heart-rending shrieks and anguish and terror. Then, as the trap door collapsed inside the cottage, a whirlwind of fire shot into the loft, pierced the thatched roof, and rose to the sky like the flame of a huge torch, and the whole cottage went up in flames. Nothing more could be heard inside the cr but the crackling of flames, the crumbling of walls, and the crashing of beams. All of a sudden, the roof fell in, and the glowing carcass of the house was hurled up into the air amid a cloud of smoke, a great fountain of sparks. The white countryside lit up by fire glistened like a cloth of silver tinted with red. In the distance a bell rang. Old Mother Savage remained standing in front of her, burnout home, armed with her gun, her son's gun, for fear that one of the men should escape, and she saw that it was all over. She threw the weapon in the fire, an explosion rang out. People came running up, peasants and Prussians. They found the woman sitting on a tree trunk, calm and satisfied. A German officer who spoke French like a Frenchman asked her, Where are your soldiers? She stretched out her thin arm towards the red heap of the dying fire and replied in a loud voice, In there. They crowded around her. The Prussian asked, How did the fire break out? I started it, she said. They didn't believe her, thinking that the disaster had driven her mad all of a sudden. So as everyone gathered around her to listen to her, she, sold, she told the story from beginning to end, from the arrival of the letter to the last screams of the men who had been burnt within her house. And she didn't leave a single detail out of what she had felt or what she had done. And when she had finished, she took two pieces of paper out of her pocket and in order to tell them apart, put on her spectacles again. Then, showing one of them, she said, This one is Victor's death. Showing the other and nodding in the direction of the red ruin, she asked, This one is their name, so as you can write to their families. She calmly held out a white sheet of paper to the officer who was holding her by the shoulders and went on, You must write to say what happened and tell their parents that it was me that did it. Victoire Simon, the savage woman, don't forget. The officer shouted out some orders in German, and she was seized and pushed against the walls of the house, which were still warm. Then twelve men lined up quickly, facing her at a distance of twenty yards. She didn't budge. She had understood and stood there waiting. An order rang out, followed straight away by a long volley. A late shot went off by itself after the others. The old woman didn't fall. She collapsed as if her legs had been chopped off. The Prussian officer came over to her. She had been practically cut in two. In her hand, she was clutching her letter soaked in blood. My friend Serval added, it was by way of a reprisal that the Germans destroyed the local chateau, which belonged to me. I, for my part, was thinking of the mothers of the four gentle boys burned in there, and of the fearful heroism of that other mother shot against that wall. And I picked up a little stone, still blackened by the fire.
Thank you.